And I just got a PS4. So. <laughs> Are you playing games on it or? So the reason I got it is because Kingdom Hearts 3 just came out and I've been waiting 13 years for that third one to come out. I missed my PS4 only for football. But at the same time, I'm gonna have the fucking time to play football. All right. And I'll just feel, I think I've gotten to that point to where if I'm doing something mindlessly for too long without like setting myself up, cause you have someone like Kevin Hart who loves Madden, who can play. But he also has set himself up in his life to where he might be done with the project for a little while. If he's done with work and he has other things moving and that's all set, you might have an assistant or whatever who's handling all that stuff. You got time to play. I don't have an assistant. Mm -hmm. I'm just getting started. I don't have time to do any of that stuff right now until I've already got to where I wanted to be at. Yeah, I, I think that's a good mindset to be in. I think like a lot of people uh, complain about not having time but then when you really look at the way they divide your time, they're kind of wasting a lot of it. And I'm like, well, you spend at least a couple hours watching TV or mm -hmm. this and this, or you wake up really late when you could wake up a little bit earlier and do these things. Right. I think I'm more observant of that now yeah. more than ever. Even when I feel like I deserve the time, I just need to like kick back and do nothing. And you do, 100%. And then I just sit down like I could be doing something else right now more productive. I know I got to get this stuff done. Yeah. I mean, that recharge time is just as, if not more important. Exactly. Yeah. It's like working out. Like, you can't just keep blasting a muscle body part. Just chest. Yeah, just, just chest, no legs. People just do chest all day. <laughs> Top part's just crazy fucking strong. <laughs> Ask them to kick a leaf and they break their toe. Yeah. <laughs> I think that was the wrong move for you. That was a terrible move. I know, that's why I <laughs> right. Because, uh, yeah, <clears throat> shit like that happens. When's the last time you went to therapy? Funny story, I was supposed to go yesterday. Got too busy at work, I forgot all about it. Oh, really? Because my last day at that branch, so I got the branch manager to buy branch lunch. Mm. So usually when that happens, you don't take a break. But I forgot. It was like 12.40 and I got the call. So on my way taking someone back, I had to call them and reschedule. Do you have to pay for sessions you don't take? That's the question I asked, but I thought so. But uh, as far as what I've been told, no. There's no penalty for it. Yeah. So I just rescheduled it for the 27th on Wednesday. You do it during lunch or you go ahead? I usually do it during my lunch break. <laughs> It's like a doctor's appointment, I'll let them know too. Usually, well now that I go, I'm gonna be a little further out, it's probably gonna be about an hour 20. Doesn't, doesn't like doing it at lunch kind of rush it? Not how I, not where I was located before, because I will leave like five minutes ahead of time and I'll be there. And then the place was literally five minutes away from branch. So it didn't take me that long to get there. It didn't take me that long to leave. Mm. And I'm still not going to rush it this time. It's just going to be, have to be one of those things that they understand. And I'm going to let them know ahead of time, like I go to therapy. So right. this lunch break will probably be longer than usual. It's only like two times a month, one time a month maybe. Mm. Definitely got to put a stress on it because it just helps me, makes me sharper doing everything else that I do. I mean, like when you do it, like if you do it during lunch, do you feel more energized afterwards when you come back to work or? So the whole day, like when I wake up and I know I'm going to therapy, for some reason, I feel better that day to start off. Oh yeah. I don't know if it's because, it's like when you going on a field trip, and you know the field trip's coming that day. Yeah. In my mind, that's the field trip for me. Right. So I got stuff I'm ready to talk about. And then afterwards, you get a little bit more clarity or you were able just to talk and just let it out. So you feel better even more afterwards. Um, so when I get there and we end up going back and forth and she lets me know, you know, not so much as the way you were thinking, but try these techniques when you go through this stuff or um, 
she tries to dot, get the dots lined up of things I'm talking about, and not, they're not always in order, but she connects them. You're like, ah, oh, well, maybe. And you just end up talking about it yourself. It's weird. That's what they do, right? Yeah, they just look at you. Yeah. And they shake their head. Yeah. And they'll ask like a few questions here and there, and you end up just connecting the dots yourself. Yeah. Things you've always already thought. You just never really had an outlet to talk it through. Because maybe you were embarrassed. People are usually embarrass being, uh, what's that word? Vulnerable? Vulnerable. Yeah. So you don't want to tell it to everybody because you think that person's going to use it against you. And then you look weak. So when that happens, you always got to put on the front and a strong face. But then you start holding a lot of shit in, especially if you're not an extroverted type person. And who able just to say whatever's on their mind, no matter what. Maybe you don't need a therapy or a therapist. Um, your therapy is you just being you and telling it to everybody, and not caring the, about the results. Introverts have a harder time doing that. Mm -hmm. And I'm like a introvert with extroverted tendencies. I can go out, I can hold conversations, um, but and I can do small talk. I can be good at it. I hate it. I right. don't enjoy it. I was watching that documentary with Avicii. Mm, and yeah, side yeah. topic, I didn't even know he died. Yeah, it was like last summer? Yeah. yeah. Like maybe I did, but I forgot about it. What's interesting about him was he, he did not like performing. He just liked making beats. But he was good at performing. And he was on a tour bus one time. And he brought up, you know, like a life coach who made this point about, um, you know, why we act the way we act, act, and especially introverts. But he was someone who said, you know, I like small, I mean, I can do small talk, but I hate it. I'd just rather not do it. And, you know, it's, it's hard for that person to, to open up when they'd rather just be either left alone or kind of doing their own thing. But he has to, he has to open up, he has to be in front of people. So you imagine you're big, at that point in time, like he was better than anybody else. Constantly have to perform, constantly have to perfect his craft and come out to these shows and be good. There's a lot of pressure on him mm -hmm. to be perfect. He just didn't want that anymore. And that ultimately led to, unfortunately, him, him taking his life, which was a sad thing. Because he, he even quit. He even wanted to quit. And he just felt like someone, his agents or whatever, kept pulling him back in to do more shows and say, I don't want to do any more shows. I'd just rather be to myself. That's tough, man. I, I feel like, uh, is it your move or is it my move? It's my move. Oh, okay. I just don't know what the fuck to do. <laughs> Cause uh, that queen fucked me up. Yeah. I think with, uh, it's interesting about Vici and I think it happens with a lot of people, especially artists, is like you do art because you love the craft of making music or making or painting or whatever. Mm -hmm. But like, I've heard a lot of times when that art form turns into like a business for you, that it puts a lot of pressure on you to have to create these things to make a living. Mm -hmm. And you're no longer doing it because you love it. You're putting these situations where you're doing it to make money for yourself, make money for agents or other people, and like, it's no longer something that you really want to do. Mm -hmm. And that's when people get depressed and really sad and upset about the situation that they're in, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. It's, you never see yourself, you know, well, some people might, but like when you're just doing something you love and you just so happen to be one of the best at it, you typically don't see yourself at that level. Right. And if you do, you're like, all right, that's cool, because you see other people who are famous and making money there, and they look like they're having fun. Everybody wants to be this, this celebrity, to be well-known, to all eyes be on them. But you don't, mm -hmm. really. I think, look at the way that a lot of us live. We live isolated. And as much as I love to be a part of a community, and be next to my neighbor and put things back into the front yard so people can just hang out with each other again. That's just with your neighborhood, and that's comfortable. 
Imagine if someone always was watching what you did, telling you need to do this, act this way, be here at this time. You really couldn't do what you want? That's tough. Because um, I thought about it, I was like, LeBron James, and I love me some Brown Brown. He's probably one of the most criticized people on this planet as an athlete. A lot of pressure he put on himself, said I'm going to be the greatest. Um, some got a lot of hating. They just don't want to like LeBron just because he's LeBron, and they love MJ. Mm. So they never want to put two and two together. But in sports, you know how you get heckled? And how some people have responded to heckling, whether that's Russell Westbrook, and I know I'm just throwing names at you right now because <laughs> you don't really watch it. But there's occasions where they snap back at fans. And well deservedly so, because fans just, I think they act out of pocket. They just say whatever they want to because they know nothing's going to happen. Because they have a glass wall, and it's like, do it if you want to. You're going to be in more trouble than me. Mm. He's never once snapped back at a fan. And I'm sure he's heard a lot of shit. And the way he has to keep mentally tough is something I probably revere to be at that type of level and to be as successful as he is. And to keep that in tune. And one thing he does is he doesn't do social media that much, definitely not during the season. Someone else probably might be controlling it, but he's not looking at comments, not reading any of that stuff, because that shit will fuck with you. And it did for him for a while. It fucked with him in the beginning. And he just stopped. And I love to, like when I'm not by my phone, which I have it down here right now, I can leave that shit alone. When I'm at home, mm -hmm. it's somewhere else. I don't give two shits about it. The only reason why I'm on it so much is, thank Detroit, because I got to make sure things look good. It's the best way that I can. If I didn't, I would not touch my phone at all. It's just better that way. Mm -hmm feels better. You don't have to worry about like messages coming in. Just a lot was thrown at you all that one time. It's easier when you have good people around you. Yeah, it's so, definitely like yeah. So like LeBron probably has good people around him. His boys? Letting him know. Yeah, being real with him. Like we were talking about earlier. Somebody that can tell you, hey, you know, I've been noticing this and... Yep. And for him, that's been his boys. Yeah. yeah. Maverick Carter, Rich Paul. I forget my other man's name, but they put basically grown up together in a sense. They met each other all in Ohio. Now they all run separate enterprises, but all together. Yeah. And it's just the four of them. So their circle is small. That's a dream, man. <laughs> yeah. Their circle is small as fuck. Yeah. But then that's all they need. So Rich Paul has an agency. Maverick Carter does uninterrupted and um he's one of the the big reasons why how they signed that billion dollar deal with nike for a lifetime um because he did an internship at nike so when he brought them in lebron was the product and when he brought lebron brought them in they decided we just don't want to be here for the ride right we want to turn this into something else yeah and then learn on our own so the Maverick learned everything about Nike that he could and asked questions. Um, Rich Paul worked for CAA, which we know is the biggest time agency. And then he, once he was done with that, now he has his own clutch sports. So he, his clients are LeBron James, Anthony Davis, uh, Ben Simmons, and these are big names in the NBA. Mm -hmm. That's him. And my other guy, again, I feel bad, I forget his name, but anywhere that LeBron goes, to a team, he's a part of that. So he's like an administrator, staff, and agent or something like that around that time. But he makes sure things run smooth with the team or if you're showing up to full locker deals, things like that, things are in order. Whether that's a commercial or something, things are in order. So having that close knit circle with them, look out for each other, but be like, look, you're fucking up. Like you look stupid as fuck doing this. That's cool. But then they confide in each other when things are not going so well. We're going to get there. I'm going to get to my move. But yeah, we're going to get there. Yeah. Remember that first time we hung out? Was it Charlotte for NACA? Yeah. And we were like, you know, there was like downtime. I didn't know what to do, but it was like there was downtime. It was like, what are you about to do? Like, I don't know. You want to walk around the city? Yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we're just exploring and just looking at shit. And even from that point, we started talking about how things were and how things were trending, not knowing where it might go, but I remember just walking by these restaurants and they were just like one namers, kitchen. Oh yeah, yeah. Bar. <laughs> That's just how shit was gonna go. And now the more simplistic things are, it's cool without putting like a huge name on it. And then you got restaurants named kitchen or you got restaurants named bar or you got I don't know, you don't got hospitals named hospitals because it's already a hospital. <laughs> <laughs> we have an ice cream parlor, it's called ice cream. Yeah. And they're like, the most, has the most flavors of ice cream that you can ever have. Yes. Everybody loves them. Yes. Just think the name is just so, wow, it made it this simple. And so then we go to OU, plan events, um, and you've always had like a, you're always hungry for more. And that's not attention, but with you learning yourself a little bit more, you start learning more about what you can do, what you wanted to do. There was knowledge that you wanted to have. And everyone loved you, bro. I remember talking to Corinne, I'll tell anybody this, but when people talk to you, it's like a therapist type level. You don't even have to say anything. People are comfortable confiding in you. And I think that's a huge skill that you have. It's the reason why you do podcasts and other stuff. You listen very well. Uh, and then people can tell that you're in tune with what they're saying. Or at least it looks that way. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, you love hearing other stories and hearing other people, how they do things and how their mind operates. And that helps you decide, you know, not so much who you're going to be, but, you know, what, what can I do next? Or what can I learn from that person? in order to share it with somebody else, whether that is in video form. So for you, I guess, when you're, when you've done podcasts and when you're doing this thing that you're doing right now, and you talk to people, what is more of your outlet? Because you have your own kind of story of mental health or mm. just being content or happy with yourself. Yeah. Well, I think like, Uh, kind of like talking about how you know people are like always watching you mm -hmm. and expecting you to act a certain way. Like I think that was a lot of my life in the community that we grew up in. So like this like Pakistani Muslim community, uh, and I think a lot of it, looking back at it, might have been like self-inflicted. Mm -hmm. But definitely a huge part of the community was this like pressure to like be something that you might not want to be, whether that's like an engineer or a doctor or a lawyer. And those are like the only three options. And if you don't pick those, then it's like, what is this kid doing? And then that's just professionally. Also, like, you know, you have to act a certain way. You have to treat people with a certain kind of respect. And that is something that I agree with. You should always respect your elders and all mm -hmm. that, right? But you, you always are putting on a, a mask for the community. You're always concerned about what other people will think if our family does this. And like seeing that and growing up around that, uh, I don't know, I think it's like really restricting. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, for me, always going against the grain, 100% of the time, my entire life, mm -hmm. not, being, not being in any of those professions and being in, involved in things that my peers, my other like Pakistani friends weren't doing, like theater, mm -hmm. uh, or making friends with people that weren't from the same community, I think that was kind of seen as like, in the beginning, what is, you know, what is he doing? But it isn't until you can prove otherwise that, oh wow, like, he got to speak in front of 2,000 people, he got to go act at this thing, he got mm -hmm. to, he gets to travel to all these different places with these programs that he's being a part of, 
I think my kids should go do those things too. Right. So it's really cool to be able to be an example. But when you are the example, you have to go through that like bullshit of criticism, mm -hmm. which is kind of, which sucks, you know, because that just lets you know that the community isn't supportive mm -hmm. of people chasing after what they want. Right. So anyway, I think like that's just one part of it, but it wasn't, I know that another big part of it is like my dad and my, my mom and my dad, like my dad is like staunchly atheist. Mm -hmm. And he's always been like, if you're going to believe in something, then you better know why you're going to believe in it. Right. And my mom is more so religious. And we went to like Sunday school and we'd go to the mosque and we'd be included in a lot of religious activities. Right. Uh, more so for her sake and for the sake of the community because you want to look like you're part of the community. Uh, and then also because... Yeah, I mean, I, honestly, most of it was like, it's like optics, right? You want, like, I'm Muslim by association. Mm -hmm. I'm Muslim because that's the way I was raised. Right. But like, am I actually Muslim? I wouldn't consider myself Muslim. Right. So, <clears throat> like that juxtaposition in my life, the juxtaposition of the community I was raised in, uh, as opposed to the community I chose to be involved in, mm -hmm. uh, and the juxtaposition of the way that my dad taught us versus the way my mom taught us, mm -hmm. and then, me honestly having to figure everything out myself because I had no role model that had done the things that I did, or right. has been through the same experiences I have been through, right. and kind of creating that path on my own, and realizing that like what's really important at the end of the day is having people like you in my life that are really supportive and choose to be a part of this team mm -hmm. and like want to grow together, and these kind of relationships are what really matters. So like, I think being able to talk to people about that experience is on a different level mm -hmm. is more so therapy for me. Mm -hmm. uh, but like now trying to understand what a lot of the motivations in my life like came from and why I do the things that I do, mm -hmm. that is a journey I'm trying to figure out. And I think I gotta go, I think I gotta start going to therapy to kind of understand that. Do you feel like what you're doing right now helped out, helps out with that a little bit more? Like from your last video, yeah. you got an anxiety attack, but rather than just like keeping it to yourself, you thought this might be a good time to record it just so you can talk through it. Yeah. And the responses that you may have gotten or may not have gotten might have helped out as well. Because people have said, I just went through that myself five mm -hmm. minutes ago, or thank you for that because I usually go through these and maybe I just need to vent it out or just talk it out with someone or put it on a recording. Um, do you feel like that's been therapy for you? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's too early for me to know whether that's healthy or not. Mm -hmm. I think like, yeah, I, I, I put that video out there and it was really important for me to do that. And I'm glad that people could see that and relate to it. And the advice that I got was really helpful. Uh, but like, I just don't know. I, I think I'm, I think like I just am questioning it too much. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like I'm really, really skeptical. And, I'm, and you know this, like whenever we have meetings about anything, like I just feel really skeptical about everything. Yeah. And so if somebody comments about something that I do, about anything, then I'm like, you don't actually mean that. That's not real. Right. You know? And I've always been like that. So I don't believe, whether it's true or not, like a lot of the times when people comment on it, I just don't believe it. Right. Because you feel like that's supposed to be the reaction someone's supposed to have. Yeah. Very nice. Right. It feels like a thoughts and prayers type of deal. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I've been more intent about that side topic. Just one quick comment. I've been more intent about that because we learned that in church. So I'm non-denominational. Uh, I believe in God, but at the same time, I need to know more. Right. I can't just, I can't hold my own in the conversation just yet. If someone says, you know, why do you believe? Outside of me just telling you how I feel in my experiences. But people always say, you know, I'm going to pray for you. Right. But they don't really pray. Right. And I've done that. 
way back. I was like, I'll pray for you. And like, that is the prayer. Me just saying those right. comments. Now I'm more intent with saying, you know, when I pray for you, instead of like holding it off till later, I do it right then and there. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm in the car or something. I just, a couple of sentences. I just throw it up. Um, I think where we relate in a lot of instances is upbringing. So how I grew up was with my mom. As far as I can know, it's just been my mom that's been there. So of course you don't see the sacrifices until you get a lot older um, and then just see how, what she has sacrificed, what she's given up. Because I've never went without, I've never known what it is to be broke. Um, Because things were always provided to me, things that I needed. But in that black community, um, there is a, there's certain outlets of where you can go. Of course, sports, entertainment, things like that. That's one huge outlet. Um, being that we've had to fight so hard to get, you know, just some basic rights, whether that's going to school, whether that's doing something else. I'm a free spirit by nature. I just like to do stuff. And I might not always think it through. That's why I have my wife there who's, yeah. who is the planner. So we just kind of yin yang each other so well. But, you know, I don't like to go through the traditional ways at all. I was going to a school in Virginia that a lot of my school had been paid for by federal government. I wouldn't have the debt that I would have right now if I would have stayed in Virginia. But also wouldn't have the experiences that I have right now if I would have stayed in Virginia. My mom was so opposed to me leaving. Naturally so. She's my mom. She doesn't want me to leave her by her side. But I remember one thing that always stuck with me was, you know, mom, I just don't like that school. It's too close to home not getting anything out of it. And she said, I don't give a shit what you like. You're not paying for school, you're not doing this, that, and the other. You should just go to school. I don't never, never like that. Because on one end, I have to get it from her side because she's, she's been supportive, but at the same time, she's more of a realist. Mm. I'm an optimist. So if I don't feel like that's in my heart to do, I don't want to do that, and I'm not going to get anything out of it. I've been crazy smart growing up, but if I'm bored with class, if it's not challenging, I'm not going to do well. And that's just how I live my life now. That follows me with an occupation or a job. I've been in two different jobs, and I just get bored after a year. It's not what I want to do. So when I'm able to, 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 to branch out, and um, you know, break the norms and be that example. Because with it just being her, and then not having my dad so much in the picture, like I love him, he's been there, but I haven't learned much from him. Mm. So my biggest struggle has been trying to figure out what it's like to be a man, um, and then how to operate as a man. So you got that portion of fatherhood, you got another portion of, you know, a little bit more, maybe support following my dreams, maybe hearing out what I want to do. Um, and then three, another layer on top of that, and these are all things I talked about in therapy. It just, the shit just came up. Um, I got my brother who's five years apart from me. All right. I love him too. But growing up, I feel like growing up as a single child. So I have brothers. I got a whole slew of siblings, but they're halves. I won't consider them halves because they're all blood, we're all brothers and sisters. You're not step, half brother, whatever. But just growing up in my house, I did things separately. I never went to school with my brother except for one year in college. So I'm going to school with kids who their cousins live three doors down or they do everything together. I didn't have that. Mm -hmm. So now I feel like I'm the only child um, and I gotta learn what it's like to be the only child living in a society in Virginia Beach. So always figuring stuff out on my own has always been something I've had to do. Um, some portion I've liked, some I haven't, because it's made me insecure in a lot of fashions. Especially being black in the area where I was from. It wasn't a hood area by any means where I lived at, but my school was considered hood. So if you weren't hard, then you were soft. 
And that's a whole different stigma of constantly having to be hard. Because um, I was probably, wasn't the most popular, but I was probably like 60, 70 percent out. People knew of me, people knew Khalid. I didn't really have problems with nobody. Um, but at the same time, I wasn't, I wasn't someone people probably revered or afraid of. I kept to myself a lot. Played football, had friends, went home, had a curfew, which sucked. Yeah. But well, all the other kids were hanging out all day. I had to check in every hour, hour and a half. When I mean check in, that's not a phone call. I had to physically come back home. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so we would, like, we would question people like, all right, we're going to go down here and we're going to go play football. And I'm like, shit, that's 20 minutes away. We want to play football. I probably got like 20 minutes to play football before I have to tell y'all I got to go home and check in. Then I got to hightail it back home in order to get there at a certain time. Every hour? Every hour, hour and a half. Yeah. And each year as I got older, it increased maybe by a half an hour. So I was always a kid to leave early. And I hated that. Mm. I still have a problem doing that now. Corinne gets pissed off at me. Because when she says, when time are you going to be home? And I say three, I'm usually home by 3.30, 3.45. That's just how it is. <laughs> yeah. I can't help it. Right. Sometimes I want to be home on time, but it's, it's, I think that's what sticks with me. It's me always being held back and not being able to do anything, everything that I want to do. Because mm. I had to leave early, so I couldn't really explore. So there's a lot of restrictions. Um, and not out of malintent or out of, you know, uh, uh, unsupportiveness. I think a lot of it was out of fear. Um, and a lot of it was out of um, I think a lot of it was out of, you know, this is what I want you to do and this is what you should be doing. Yeah. And I never agreed with that. And now that I have a daughter, that's what I want to show her. I support her no matter what she does. Because I want to be that example of her being able to, to do what she does because she's going to see daddy do what he wants to do. So if she doesn't want to go to school, that's fine. But the caveat is you got to be doing something. Mm -hmm. Like you just can't be doing anything. If you have a dream, we'll support it. If you save up for enough now, then what I didn't get when I graduated high school, not everybody gets this, but I want her to be able to have a good start chunk of change. Mm -hmm. But you basically got to show mommy and daddy proof of why, before we turn this money over to you, why and what you're going to do with it. And then you kind of go from there. So we relate to a lot in, in similar ways because one of the community aspect of it, you know, of being within a box and having to do this, um, but also wanted to branch out and just figure out shit. Sometimes we had to do that because we we're forced to figure out other shit, um, but just true interest in learning other things from other people and learning how other cultures and communities live. Yeah. Because being within one box sucks. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think like a lot of that is, uh, like you said, kind of figuring out what it means to be a man. It's hard. I mean, now, like, there are conversations that people have about that and are more open to, like, what manhood even means. Mm -hmm. But, like, like, what do you think manhood means to you now? Because the way you think about it now is not the way you thought about it before. Mm -hmm. And it's probably not the way you're going to think about it in a year. Right now, mm -hmm. it's being there for my family and not being like, manhood isn't like coming home and being like, you know, where's my dinner? And all this other type of shit. Um, it's having that household that, you know, that you are the king of, that is your domain, your kingdom to rule. But at the same time, my wife is my partner. There's things that she holds me up and she takes care of me. What she does right now, it's not something that everybody can do. Um, and manhood also isn't just paying bills for me. It's making sure your family's good. Um, and all that stuff is in order. And your kids are taken care of. Your wife is taken care of. The same mm -hmm. way she takes care of you. And being supportive. 
and what they want to do, not just what I want to do. I think that's selfish and that can hold a lot of things back. And sometimes for a man, it's been, in your household, you seem like the baddest motherfucker that there is. And you tell someone to do something, they do it. And in some aspects, that has been a result of them working something, or working in a job they don't want to do. So people are telling them what to do every single day. So they feel demasculated. Oh, yeah. right. So now they have to be a man at home. And I think it's a misconstrued version of what that manhood should be. Mm. So my daughter is my, is my entire heart. And being with how I grew up, with just having my mom, who did phenomenal things when I think about it, um, it's me being present in her life. And I want to show her things. I want to teach her things. So for me, it's always just been present within the house and being supportive with everybody that's there. And they'll be supportive as you. I can be as busy as I want to be, but if my household ain't in order, I feel like my life sucks. Yeah. So there's a lot of successful business people who are good at what they do, make a shit ton of money. But they miss out on time with family. Right. And that's very important for me. That means the most, rather than trying to make a shit ton of money. If I got those memories, that money more than likely is going to come, or enough of it's going to come to where I'll be all right. I don't need, don't need two, five, ten million dollars mm. in order to be successful. I just need enough to be comfortable. And then for my family to be comfortable. Yeah. And then for us to do things as a family, what we want to do. So that's for me what it's like to be a man. For now, that shit might change tomorrow. Yeah, exactly. Is it your go? Is it my go? I think so. Oh, well, damn, man. I've had this cool-ass movie. Boys. Oh, cool.